This is a beautiful church building, but it's not the church. This is the connector, a place where so many of us gather for fellowship, where we share information about the ministries of our church. This place is important. But it's not the church. This is our chapel, the original place where we worshiped as a congregation 150 years ago. It's a holy place. It's a place where we still gather and have coffee and tell stories and see our friends, where we have large gatherings where we bless those who are new parents, where we hear stories of transformation. But it's, it's not the church. This is our fireside room. It's one of our major educational rooms and I teach a Bible study in here every Monday. It's a wonderful place where I've learned lots of things and where I've grown closer to God. But it's not the church. I'm in the Christian Education Wing. It's a place where we teach our children the stories of Jesus and our youth, hang out in fellowship with each other and own their own faith. These are wonderful places filled with wonderful people, but this is not the church. This is the choir room. It's a place where we sing praises to God and we prepare worship for Sunday. It's a beautiful room. And to be in here when the choir sings is heavenly. But it's not the church. This is the place where we so often gather for worship. We prepare to go in. This is the place where families gather before a memorial service and say a prayer. It is, it's a holy place. But it's not the church. This is a gorgeous sanctuary, one of the most beautiful that you will ever find. But this is not the church.
Gracious and loving God, we lift our hearts and voices to you, giving thanks for your protection of us in the midst of challenging circumstances all around us. You have listened and given heed to the words of our prayers, and we are grateful. We sing psalms of adoration, O God, gathering in praise of your name. You sent Jesus Christ to make your will known to your people, and you promise your Holy Spirit to guide us along our paths. Be among us to gather our words of devotion and be in us as we seek to obey your will and your way. We call upon you now, Holy One, naming you as eternal, ever present and boundless in love as we pray together these words of confession. Gracious Lord, we are slow to acknowledge a love that triumphs over death, and we are slow to claim our hallelujahs even in this Easter season. We're slow to believe that the one who gave himself fully away showed us a life more powerful than death. But we have witnessed that Jesus and his love can triumph over our impoverished notions of what a savior can be. Love has triumphed over the pain inflicted by those who counsel hatred. Love has triumphed over our hearts of fear. And we say with voices resounding that we believe that love has triumphed over the grave. When our belief is shallow, Lord, bolster us with your grace. Amen. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And now let us say together what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Coast, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. And now I'd like to invite the children to come closer to the screen for their own message. Good morning, boys and girls, and people of all ages and stages. I'm so glad to be with you this morning. You know, there's a lot of ways to tell a Bible story. Sometimes we act them out. Sometimes we read them from the Bible. Sometimes we have those fun little figures and put them on the felt board. Sometimes there's puppets. Sometimes there's videos. But today we have a very fun and special way to hear this morning's Bible story. So I want you to come up close so that you can hear and see and enjoy this wonderful telling of the story of the road to Emmaus. Lord, open our eyes that we might see and hear the beautiful things in your word. Listen carefully. Two of the disciples were walking to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. I met him when I was following John the Baptist. John told me to follow him instead. I met him when he raised the widow's son. <sighs> and now he's gone. I mean, maybe... An idle tale. Nothing more. I mean, that was an atrocious weekend. The worst Passover ever. I can't believe he's gone. I thought he'd be the one to save us. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Hello. 
Hi. Hi. What are you all talking about? Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? The what things? The things about Jesus, a mighty prophet, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be crucified. But we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Some of the women in our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. I mean, maybe. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. I mean, Isaiah went on and on about it. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. Where are you going? Stay with us. Because it's almost evening and the day is nearly over. There are like lions out there and stuff. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized Jesus, and he vanished from their sight. What? I did not see that coming. I also did not see that coming. To be fair, you rarely see anything coming. Or not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? I thought it was something I ate. Immediately they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. Guys, we've seen the Lord. He is risen. Friends, I'm sitting here inside our sanctuary, actually for the first time in about a month. It is indeed a beautiful place, a holy place, what the Celtic people might have called a thin place, a place where heaven and earth and the boundary between them is very thin. It is an extraordinary sanctuary. Is a place where I have over and over in my life felt the presence of God. But it's not the church. And it's not even necessary. Part of what I love about the Emmaus story is nobody knows where Emmaus is. There are a variety of people who will tell you, oh, it's this city or that city, but even the early manuscripts of Luke disagree with just how far it was away from Jerusalem. And so there are several cities that people have suggested are Emmaus. Emmaus doesn't show up at all in the Old Testament. Doesn't show up anywhere else in the New Testament. It's this nothing little city where two of the, not even the 12, were going home because their hopes had been dashed. It's one of the most pathos-filled lines in Scripture. We had hoped he would be the one to save us. And so they're returning home. They're returning to this place that no one knows or remembers. It's a very ordinary place. Two disciples, but not people who were among the twelve. You would expect after a resurrection that that Jesus would would come back to a place of profound significance. That he would show himself in the temple. They'd be first known in Jerusalem. 
But instead, he first shows up to the women at the tomb, and then to these two travelers on the way to a city no one remembers. If you are missing this place, like I am missing this place, if you're missing the thinness of this place, take a moment to remember that Jesus' resurrection, his profound resurrection where he was known to the disciples in the breaking of the bread through this very ordinary meal, happened in a very ordinary town town. Two very ordinary disciples. That's who Jesus is. He shows up in the places where we are. He does not expect us always to come to him, but he shows up where we are for what we need during our moments of extreme doubt or discomfort. Part of this text is that Jesus shows up and Cleopas begins to describe who Jesus is. He says he was a prophet, mighty in word and in deed. For most of us, that would be an extraordinary description. A prophet, mighty in word and deed. For Jesus, it does not do him justice. For Jesus, he was... Well, he was the savior. We had hoped he would be the one to save us. And yet now death has shown that Jesus could not save them. That's what he thought. And so he still admires Jesus. He still speaks well of him, a prophet mighty in word and deed, but he no longer describes him as as the Savior, because his eyes could not recognize him in that moment. It doesn't say why his eyes could not recognize him, it just said that they were prevented. But I wonder if it was grief, I wonder if it was pain suffering, disillusionment, a wondering whether God actually keeps God's promises. They put so much hope. We had hoped he would be the one to save us. They put so much hope in Jesus. And now he was gone. We all have difficult times. We tend to hide them. We don't share them with other people. But I can stand up in that pulpit up there and look out across a sea of people and see the difficult times in their lives. People who have lost family members to illness, to violence, People who have been estranged from ones they love, people who have been divorced, people who have children who are in jail or who are suffering. Every one of us carries something. Quite often we keep it hidden. The extraordinary thing about this moment in our history is that we are all suffering at the same time. Indeed, we might be holding up well under the pressure. We might have a good outlook. We might be reframing it to wonder what it is that we can learn at this time. But I, I will tell you this. I am incredibly well suited as a person for a moment like this. I'm an introvert. I have lots of hobbies that I enjoy that don't involve the outdoors. Um, I'm prone to, to thinking and to spending time in solitude. And this is hard for me. 
So I imagine for some of you, it must be enormously painful. This idea that we will always know what's going to happen, that we are in some sort of withdrawal from the myth of certainty in our lives, this is hard. And our hopes, we had hoped that he would be the one to save us, our hopes. <sighs> What do we do with them? What do we do if we, if we can't come to church and gather in this beautiful sanctuary in this thin place and wonder, what has God offered to us? How will we persevere? Well, the answer is in this story. The story depicted just over me in the window. Jesus goes to them. Jesus goes to the ones whose hearts have been broken. Jesus goes to them, the ones who are on the outside of the 12. Jesus goes to them in a place that they do not expect, that we do not even remember, and says, here I am. Do not doubt, but believe. I am with you. I'm with you always, to the end of the age, everywhere that you are, I know. And you may live in a forgotten place. You might be in the most humble of circumstances right now, but I am in those as well. So as you are in your home, as you are washing the dishes, you should know that Jesus can and will be there. As you are sitting in your back room or doing the laundry, sitting on the couch, they may seem like meager spaces, but they are not meager spaces to God. As you sit down for a meal and you break bread, Your eyes will be opened. You don't need to be in a place like this for Jesus to come to you. When he comes to you, I will not say that everything will be okay. The story of Holy Week is, is not the story of everything being okay. But that everything will be graced. There will be grace in everything. Amen. I received a wonderful email this week from Samantha Armstrong. It was a painting of me painting last week in the worship service. And I thought this week, since I had so much fun putting together stop motion for our kids, that I would invite our kids as part of their offertory this week to build a Bible story out of Legos to share with the larger church. Let me encourage you to do that. And the parents who are listening, and to the grandparents who are listening, let me encourage you to find the donate button so that we can continue God's extraordinary work for such a time as this. Now I invite you to hear our musical offertory.
As we come to our time of prayer today, we lift up our mission partners around the world and in our local community. Please keep in your prayers the ministries we support through the Common Place, through the Interfaith Hospitality Network, and all other programs that reach out to meet the needs of those who are most vulnerable. We also pray for those who've been recently hospitalized. We lift up Barbara Shu and Joanne Reed. And in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection, let us be mindful of the families who have lost loved ones. We pray for Carmela Curatola's family on the death of her mother, Nifa, for Bill Lawrence's family on the death of his mother, Mary Lawrence, and for Park Blatchford's family on the death of Park's brother, Edward. Now let us join together. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, comfort us in our days of uncertainty. You know all our needs, and that is why we turn to you with confidence and hope. Enfold us this day in the embrace of your holy presence and help us to hear your love, which beats at the center of the universe. Holy God, sometimes we find ourselves victims of circumstances beyond our control. Some of us are heartbroken over a loved one's pain and we feel powerless. Still others among us are weary beyond words, drained from the struggle of getting through one difficult day after another. Holy God, draw us close. Hold us secure in your sheltering arms. Let us rest our frazzled nerves. And if we need to, let us cry until the tension drains away until we can breathe deeply a breath of cleansing, healing peace. We give you thanks, O oh God, that we can come to you in this way, for you see us as your children, precious and beloved in your sight. God, allow your peace to remain within us as we face calmly without fear the time we are living through and the anticipation of the time to come. Let us draw on your great store of strength with every step we take, every decision we make, every trial we face. And as we have been comforted in your love, let us become an oasis of comfort to those who struggle and grieve around us. Help us to be forgiving and tolerant of those who are not at their best through stress and sorrow. Make us sensitive and quick to show kindness, slow to take offense and ready to always speak of the peace and tenderness we have known from your hand. God, guide your leaders throughout the world. Show them and us the right steps back to a new normal, even as we seek to be productive and helpful. Remind us in Christ that we all have a role to play through responsible actions to care for one another. Even as we pray the prayer Christ taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us join together singing our final hymn.
the grace of God be with you. Behind you to encourage you. Beside you to befriend you. Above you to watch over you. Beneath you to lift you from your sorrows. Within you to give you the gifts of faith, hope, and love. And before you to show you the way to go. Friends, be at peace. Amen. Thank you.